I want to welcome you to the uh, wild world of uh, neuroscience. And um, these tapes are kind of the culmination of uh, everything you've learned in neuroscience. And uh, what I want you to do is I want to use these. I want you to use these tapes to integrate all the material in the course, so that instead of leaving the course with a bunch of little facts about the DSCT or the LCST or whether something's crossed or uncrossed, you'll have these 25 cases in your mind um, as you go throughout your entire medical career. So let's take this first clinical vignette, which I think is, is a classic. Um, the person comes to you and uh, been complaining about some pain in the eye and, and some headache. And um, when you do the neurological exam, you know, most of the cranial nerves are fine, but that left pupil is, is dilated and it doesn't react to light. And um, you also notice that there's a ptosis of the left, left eyelid. Um, there's some other things going on here too. You know, you test, the, you test the eye movements, you test motor strength. You can see that the you know, arms and legs are fine and everything like that. Normal finger to finger, heel to shin, that's all cerebellar testing. The main problem you got here is with one eye and you need to kind of figure out what it is. Well, this is a classic aneurysm of a posterior cerebral artery that's impinging on cranial nerve three. In this particular case, um, on the left side. Now, this brings us back to the brain stem. You can never get rid, uh, get rid of, no, you can never forget the brain stem. And um, you should recognize this is up in the level of the superior colliculus. So superior colliculus would be up here. And then you can remember we were talking about all those fibers in the, in the cerebral peduncle here, which of course we also call the smart peduncle. Then the nigra is in here. Here's a ruber duber, fab four here. And um, here's the breaking of the inferior colliculus, just for some orientation. And the main thing here is that we're, we're talking about cranial nerve three. And when you talk about cranial nerve three, you're gonna talk about a preganglionic parasympathetic part that comes out of Edinger-Westfall. And uh, it's gonna go out to the ciliary ganglion and then go out and do its work. And you're gonna also remember a somatic part here that goes to all the muscles of the eye except for LR6 and SO4. So in this particular patient, we have a problem here um, with cranial nerve three. And if we go on, you can see, this is from the vision lectures. Here we have a, a dilated pupil in the left eye, and here's a regular sized pupil over here. And um, since we have a lesion of cranial nerve three on the left, this is an efferent pupil, so there's no way that this pupil is ever gonna constrict. So if you shine light in this eye right here, you can see this isn't constricting. You put light in the bad eye, which is just the efferent pupil side, and this will constrict. So here we have a, a classic efferent pupil cranial nerve three. Now, this brings up the blood supply to the brain stem. And what we have here, here you can see your cranial nerve three right here. Here's four, it's come around from the other side. And here's your posterior cerebral artery right here. Here's your posterior communicating. So a little swelling, a little berry-like swelling right here on the posterior cerebral artery will give you some pressure here on cranial nerve three. Here's your basilar right here. Here's your vertebrals coming up to form the basilar artery, which of course runs on the basilar part of the pons right here. Here's a big cranial nerve five here just coming right out of the pons. Now, you can see that many of these vessels have relationships to some cranial nerves. I particularly like this anterior inferior cerebellar artery, which we affectionately call the ACA. You can see that it's got some relationships here to cranial nerve six and cranial nerve eight here. You can also see that these vertebrals here come right over the top of this very famous nerve right here, the hypoglossal. But if we had a little aneurysm up in here, a little swelling, you can see how cranial nerve three would be affected. Now this shows a high power view where later in the course, like where you are right now, you should recognize all these structures. Here's the optic nerve and the chiasm, area of the hypothalamus pituitary. Here are the mammillary bodies. And here comes that basilar artery. You can see the superior cerebellar artery right here. Here's that cranial nerve three. Here's the other cranial nerve three, and here's the posterior cerebral artery, and you can see the communicating artery right here. 
Now, if you look at the aneurysms in this area, you can see that we're in this particular area right here where the posterior cerebral comes off uh, the base. There are only about 4% of aneurysms occur there. Look up here where the, where the posterior communicating joins the middle cerebral, 40%. And then you get up here near the anterior communicating another 30, move out here in the middle cerebral artery, you get another 34. So even though we're talking about this particular aneurysm right here, uh, these, are, these are relatively minor. They're much more common up in these areas right here. And if this aneurysm would burst, you have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, somebody's going to complain about the worst headache uh, in their life. Now, this is to orient you to combine a little gross anatomy with neuroscience. Here's your cranial nerve 3, and this is what we're talking about, pressure on this cranial nerve 3. And you also remember that she also had some retroorbital pain, and here you can see V1 right here. So with the large size aneurysm, you can get some pressure onto V1 here, especially if you were to have the aneurysm and have all that blood floating around a subarachnoid space. So just want to try to get the headache and the vomiting in here. The vomiting would be just because of the pressure, um, could be some pressure on the meninges. If there's a bleeding, you're going to get intracranial pressure increase and the vomiting. Now, I just want to say a few things about a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and you can see the spaces right here. Here's your subarachnoid space right here. And um, so when you have one of these aneurysms, you can have some bleeding into the subarachnoid space, the subarachnoid hemorrhage. You can see all the things it can do. It can say, stay in the subarachnoid space. It could actually penetrate the parenchyma of the brain. It could penetrate the parenchyma of the brain and go down into the ventricles. You can also see that you can have a hemorrhage in the parenchyma of the brain. It could work its way into the subarachnoid space as well as the ventricles. So all these things are, can happen with subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now let me just show you what happens if it's just uh, pretty much kept to the subarachnoid space. I'll show you what that brain looks like and then I'm going to show you one that has burst and we have a little break that goes into the parenchyma of the brain. Um, here's a visual cortex back here. You can see all this bleeding here in the, from a subarachnoid hemorrhage in a subarachnoid space. And um, a couple things that I think you should know as you, as you go on in your medical career um, is the most common cause of, of spontaneous hemorrhages are, are what we call barrier saccular aneurysms. However, trauma is an important cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage. In fact, it's more common than these spontaneous berry aneurysms. And also, you should know that the CSF is going to contain a, some blood in here in the case of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, remember, this hemorrhage can also go into the, into the parenchyma of the brain, as shown right here. And um, I just wanted to show this little bulge here. Uh, this is a right internal carotid ophthalmic artery aneurysm that they treated with balloon embolization. But you can see that this inferior surface of the frontal lobe right here is brown because the subarachnoid hemorrhage, the blood, is penetrated uh, into the cortex. I also want you to see, because of all the pressure here, look what's happening here. Uh, we have a herniation, okay? You can see the herniation. You can see the uncus down here. You can see this right uncle herniation, which, of course, in this particular case, is going to cause pressure on the right third nerve and give you a right dilated pupil. Um, I thought this was kind of interesting, just uh, showing you these clips and showing you the aneurysm. Um, as far as the orientation of the rest, this is just, I want you to see what this looks like, because I think it's interesting. Um, something else I want you to know is something called top of the basilar aneurysm. Here you can see the basilar artery coming up here like this. Here's the anterior inferior, some pontine branches. Here's your superior cerebellar. And then you can see this aneurysm that's at the top of the basilar right here. So you could see something like this would also affect, affect cranial nerve 3. So this is something you'll see in the literature, you could see on national boards, top the basilar aneurysm. So why don't we talk a little bit about some of the clinical pearls of a subarachnoid aneurysm. Um, one thing I think you should know for boards is that um, if, you have a di if you have in diabetes you have uh, nerves affected, and in diabetes you spare these autonomic fibers. 
Okay, so you're not going to get the dilated pupil, but you're going to affect the more central axons, which are going to give you problems with moving the eye. Okay? Uh, 35 to 40 percent of sacral aneurysms rupture at some time. Smoking, of course, is bad. Happens a little bit more in women. And um, affects all ethnic groups, and you can look at the rest of these. And uh, just kind of think about some of these clinical pearls that you might see on national boards or you might be asked on third-year wards. Now, here's another second vignette, and um, this we're talking about a fellow named Ray Farrell, 25-year-old young man, presents with pain in the left chest. And there's some other things here that, that happened to him, but let's go down to the neurological exam. You can see that the cranial nerves are, are in good shape. Um, the main thing that he has is some slight weakness in the lower left extremity. Well, you should think about what possibly could cause weakness in the lower left extremity. This could be um, anywhere from cortex down through the brain stem, could be in the internal capsule, could be spinal cord. Um, so you got some weakness, could be upper lower motor neuron or lower motor neuron. But uh, let's look at this here. He's got the left knee jerk and left ankle jerk are slightly more active. All right, so that's mm, hinting at, uh, hinting at uh, upper motor neuron somewhere affecting the left side. Then you go and look at this, it says direction of the plantar reflex was downward. Well, that, that's a normal sign, but still, you know, you don't always get a, you don't always get a, a Babinski, but you do have some increased uh, pressure here on, on an upper motor neuron pathway. Let's see what else is going on in this case. Now, uh, you got some problems with your uh, temperature sensation, okay? Now, this is going to be on the right in the right lower extremity, just up to the right costal margin. Now, the, that would be around uh, dermatome T9. So here you have a problem uh, that's giving you some uh, pain and temperature problems on the right, and you've got some weakness on the left. Um, also, you've got some proprioceptive problems that are decreased a little bit on the left. And this diagnosis would be a left thoracic cord T7 meningioma. Well, a meningioma you don't know that much about, but you should know that this is the anterolateral system down here. Say we're at T7. And um, we're going to drop down two levels here. So we're going to have some pain and temperature problems from T9 on down on the right side. Here's that famous LCST. And this is going to give you some problems below T7, upper motor neuron signs, increased uh, reflexes. And here is the dorsal column system, which is on the left side, which is going to give you some problems in two point, et cetera in the lower extremity. Um, this just kind of shows the spinal cord. I wanted to, I wanted to make sure that uh, you can tell the difference between a disc and a body. Here's the spinal cord right here, okay? And here right here is labeled number three as a dura. So four would be the epidural space, six subdural space. And some of these meningiomas uh, start growing from, the, from kind of funky arachnoid cells and um, can put pressure on the spinal cord kind of from the lateral surface. So it's not, a, it's not a lesion inside the spinal cord, it's out here surrounding the spinal cord. And this just shows, not from our case, but a meningioma. Here you can see the vertebral bodies in the disc. Here's a meningioma, not from our case, but I just wanted to show you what it would look like uh, on, a, on an MRI. And then uh, just a couple pearls about meningiomas. Um, they constitute about 18% of all intracranial and 25% of all intraspinal neoplasms. They peak about mm, midlife. Uh, I remember, though, um, Elizabeth Taylor had one when she was about in her 60s. Um, they arise, these, these uh, uh, neoplastic cells arise from, from arachnoid cells, and they kind of attach themselves to the dura. Lots of them are in the midline. You, you're going to see them uh, along the sagittal plane of the, of the cortex a lot, and uh, they give you headaches and seizures because they give pressure on the brain. They also can irritate the brain. Um, they grow slowly, and they're rarely, rarely malignant. So what I want you to know about this case, I want you to understand the neuroanatomy and a little bit about meningiomas. Now let's turn to the next case, which is number three. And um, the first thing you're going to see here the key would be decreased arm swing. Here's a resting tremor. 
Here's some rigidity. You know what's going on here. It's Parkinson's. You don't have to go any further, really. Let's take a look at some things here. Now, Parkinson's is a neurodegenerative disease. And um, some examples that we've had in class are Parkinson's, Huntington's, and ALS. Now, neurodegenerative diseases are most common in older people. They affect specific neuronal cell groups, like the substantia nigra, the striatum, or the spinal lower motor neurons in the case of ALS. Um, as the disease progresses, there's atrophy. Remember, there's going to be atrophy of the nigra, atrophy of the striatum in Huntington's. And there's neuronal loss and, and cellular inclusions. And one of the most famous cellular inclusions is the Lewy body. And Lewy bodies are found in substantia nigra and Parkinson's, and I'm going to show you those. Here are some early symptoms of Parkinson's. I think we all know tremor rest. Don't confuse this with a cerebellar tremor, which is a tremor when you move. You're going to have trouble starting to do simple things like buttoning up your coat. Here's an interesting one right here, micrographia. You'll notice um, that someone with Parkinson's degree, uh, uh, disease, their, their writing starts to get smaller and smaller. I don't think we, we mentioned this in the course, but this is a classic Parkinson problem. And Parkinson's is usually, idiopathic Parkinson's usually responds to L-dopa therapy. Now, I don't know whether or not you need to know all the indirect and direct pathways, but I think you should know that in Parkinson's disease, you lose the nigra, and you know the nigra excites the direct pathway, and the direct pathway gives you a lot of movement. So if you lose this, the indirect or the slowing down pathway is going to take over, and you don't get much movement. You get that bradykinesia. I want you to see a normal substantia nigra right here because you can see these blackened cells have the uh, neuromelanin in them, the pigment. Here's a Parkinson patient, nice and clear. All right. Here's a smart peduncle, cerebral peduncle right here. Here's the aqueduct. Okay, an interesting uh, clinical pearl is, is that and uh, you've already had the addiction pathways. Smoking causes an immediate release of dopamine because uh, all of a sudden nucleus accumbens starts, starts to get turned on because of that dopamine release there, and it does help in, in Parkinson's. Now, Elderpearl is a, is a drug that they gave to people to help them quit smoking, but at the same time, it keeps dopamine around a little longer. Um, as far as any chromosomal defect in Parkinson's, there has been some, uh, there's been some reports about some problems with chromosome 8. So if you can just remember chromosome 8, that's fine with me. Um, here again, you can see a washed out substantia nigra. And also, you know about the blue spot over here. This is locus cerealis. Now, when you cut this blue spot, it's really nice and dark. I think you remember it's kind of a joke in, the, in some of the practice questions. How many cells are in the locus cerealis? 20,000. So there's practice questions that's got, you know, 19,999. You remember from uh, Dr. Kalin's lectures that locus cerealis projects norepinephrine. It just goes all over the place, very alerting. So you can kind of think, oh, geez, so the locus cerealis dies. Well, what's that got to do with it? Well, that brain is not as alert. And you might also then take it one step further and say, well, there must be some slight dementia in Parkinson's. And in fact, there is. Here's a classic Lewy body right there. So here's the whole cell. So this is inside the cell, kind of a laminated body. You can see some of the melanin granules, OK? So these Lewy bodies are inclusions that are associated primarily with Parkinson's disease and, and participate, lead to the death of these cells. The classic Lewy body. Now, one thing Dan didn't talk about this year was the case of the frozen addicts out in San Francisco. You take a look at these frozen addicts, they all look like they got Parkinson's disease. Let's look at them. Kind of a masked face, passive face. And what happened was these people were trying to make Demerol in the basement. And uh, they had their own little chemistry lab in the basement. And, you know, one thing led to another, you know, and they're making their chemicals and they just mixed one car, they got one carbon off. And uh, when they injected this stuff, it, uh, it, it, we called it uh, MPTP. All right, MPTP, that's what they actually injected. And it's a toxin, and it just went right for the Niagara. And it was converted, converted to something called MPP+, 
by monoamine oxidase B, but for you, just for you, just think, you know, they're trying to make Demerol, and all of a sudden they, they inject something, kills the Nigra, and they become frozen Parkinson-like. Actually, this MP, MPTP is a, is a good model in animals for trying to come up with solutions to Parkinson. But this is something you might see on National Board of Frozen Addicts. Now let's turn to clinical vignette number four. And um, here's a acting strange, fidgety, ah, facial tics. Too much movement. Hmm. Constant movements of the face, restlessness, irritable, well, outbursts. So here's some movement problems. Oh, memory and attention. Here's some cognitive problems, Huntington's disease. Yep. So. We learned this mainly as a motor problem, but there's also cognitive problems, as you can see here with the memory. And in these, in Huntington's disease, in contrast to Parkinson's, we got too much movement. So we go back to our good old direct and indirect pathways. Now, the lesion is up here in the caudate, but it's only the cells in the caudate that go to the outer segment of the globus pallidus. Okay? So what you're really doing is slowing down this indirect pathway. The direct pathway takes over, and you have too much movement. Now, what you really have, what you'll really see is a big shrinkage here of the caudate. And you're going to say, well, gee, are there enough cells left in here, you know, to, to run the direct pathway? And there are. But the classic sign of Huntington's is shrinking gliosis of the caudate. And you see, here's a, here's a normal brain over here. This is not two sides of the same person. Here's a normal brain. Look at that anterior limb of the internal capsule right here. Here's the caudate. Here's the ventricle. Look how big this caudate. Look here. Okay. So the caudate's pretty much missing. Um, one thing I want you to know, of course, is since the caudate's gone, the ventricle's big. Now, there is a problem here with chromosome four. I want you to remember that. And in particular, there's a, uh, several base pairs are repeated many, many times. And, in, and basically, there's an increase in the length of these CAG triplets. And um, this is classic CAG, increases CAG triplets, is a, is a classic national board question for Huntington's disease. And this leads to abnormal form of something called Huntington, which when you make this Huntington, you, you actually lead to the death of the cells. So CAG triplet repeats, keep that in mind, chromosome for, for Huntington's. So if we review our, what do we know about chromosomes so far? We had Parkinson's with our problem with chromosome 8, Huntington's problem 4. Now I'm showing this picture of the frontal cortex because there's, look, how, look at the big spaces here. So here's the gyrus with a big space. So what's happening here is atrophy of this brain of these cells. So the spaces are bigger. And this is the frontal lobe. We're actually looking at the front of the frontal lobe, at the tips of the frontal lobes. In a, in, a, in a Huntington's patient. Point is dementia, major dementia in Huntington's. There is also dementia in Parkinson's, but it's not as major as it is in Huntington's. And I want to say, also show you this, that the time that Huntington's hit is really between 30 and 50 years. Um, these are some things that are going to happen in Huntington's. It's very nasty. Uh, you've heard of choreoform or dance-like dance -like movements. They're uncontrollable. These people are not doing this. They cannot control the movement. They're involuntary movements. Pretty soon they can't talk. Pretty soon they can't communicate. And then pretty soon they're in a wheelchair and ultimately they die. Now, since I'm already circling it down here, you can see that we've got something here in the periphery, something affecting nerves only, Guillain-Barre. This is classic national board. The first thing you do is you go up here and you say, oh, gee, they, got a, they had the flu. Mm -hmm. Also, they're weak. And this is kind of usually described as an ascending paralysis. Guillain-Barre is the greatest cause of paralysis of any disease. And um, this is affecting the nerves and usually just the myelin, not all the time, but usually the nerve, nerves. It's an ascending paralysis that starts with the legs and moves up to the arms. Eventually, if it gets up into the cervical cord, it's going to get to phrenic and you're going to be on a, ven on a ventilator. Um, some little tidbits. Um, you can call it acute inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculopathy if you'd like. 
Um, you can see it affects primarily motor function, but it can also affect sensory function to immune mediated um, symmetric ascending weakness. This is interesting right here. It can affect the myelin, the axon, or both. And IgG levels are high in the CSF. Now, if we look at our famous chart here with Guy and Beret, of course, you should know all these. And as we go through these cases, I'm going to go through them. If we call Guy and Beret per, uh, primarily a, a demyelinating problem, and I just said it can be axonal or combined, and it could be motor or sensory, but, but what, what the most popular ones are just the pure motor ones. You can see the conduction velocity goes down. That makes sense. But then, you know, everything else is pretty normal in here. Okay, you don't have any re -innervation. You don't have any problems with your MUPS, things like that. You don't have any problems with your CK. All right, syringomyelia. Gee, what are we going to look for? Well, this was one of the first things that uh, I ever tripped you up on. Back when we were at spinal cord and we were talking about the uh, pain and temperature pathways, remember I drew a, a dorsal horn cell, pain and temperature dorsal horn cell on one side, or actually I drew it in a, on, on both dorsal horns and I had them come down and cross. And I said, what happens if you have a lesion right where they cross? Well, it would be a bilateral loss of pain and temperature and probably be uh, two levels below. But then you learn later that in addition to just having a problem in the middle of the spinal cord, you could move out into the ventral horns where you could get the lower motor neurons, and that's going to give you some muscle atrophy. And uh, also, syringomyelia can even move out and get some of the lateral cortical spinal. But when you think about syringomyelia, you're going to think about this cape like loss of pain and temperature. You're not going to be talking about glove and stocking, where you're going to have a peripheral, peripheral neuropathy. You're going to be talking about cape like. And this shows it right here, all right? So this is a syringomyelia running from about C4 to T2. And uh, you can see that not only do you have a loss of the of pain and temperature, which means it got the crossing fibers from those dorsal horn cells, but you also have, you also have weakness right here, all right? So it means that it's gotten out into the, out into the ventral horn, all right? So let's take a look at what this would look like. So syringomyelia would be a cavitation, a slit-like cavitation in here. It's going to get the, here's a dorsal horn cell right here, dorsal horn cell. They're going to come down and cross. So you're going to interrupt those. You're going to get a deficit two levels below it. And of course, think about this slit running for more than one level. All right. Now the slit or the syrinx can also get the ventral horns. So you're going to throw in some problems some lower motor neuron problems there. And then even if it got out in here, it could kind of tweak the LCSTs, which could give you some upper motor neuron problems. But this is syringomyelia. This is a, a, mal a maldevelopment um, of the spinal cord. Um, just wanted to show you this little slit-like dead area here. Here's dorsal. Here's ventral. Here's the midline. You can kind of see how the midline. Here's the midline in the top part of the cord. Here's the midline down here. This is all the lesion here. So you can see how it get the crossing fibers. It could get some ventral horn cells. It could move up into the lateral cortical spinal tract. Um, syringomyelia could give you some upper motor neuron problems where you really don't have any of these classic tests. Um, it's going to give you some anterior horn problems where you're going to get all the classic, OK, re increase in MUPS, things like that. So make sure you know this. Now, here's one, right side cerebellar hemisphere disease. Geez, we're talking about the cerebellum now. Well, when you think about the right side of the cerebellum, you're going to think about an incoordination on the right side somewhere, correct? Now, you also notice, let's see what this patient's got here. They got a slight Horner syndrome on the right. Gee, that wouldn't come from the cerebellum. And they also got reduced pain and temperature on the left. Oh, my gosh, here we're thinking brainstem, aren't we? But if we're on the right side here, we get a right horners. If we're on the right side of the brainstem, we're going to get a problem with the left side pain and temperature. So we're somewhere on the right, and I'll bet you it's going to just move on up into the cerebellum. And it's probably going to get all the intermediate and lateral zones because we have such things as dysmetria, pass pointing, and tension tremor, all on the right side. So it looks like we've got a lesion here on the right side of the brainstem to account for the right horners and the lack of pain and temperature on the left. 
But then it's also going to move up into the cerebellar hemispheres, and it's going to give you these classic intermediate and lateral zone problems, dysmetria, pass pointing, and tension tremor on the right. So here we can review our cerebellum. We're looking down on the top of it. Here's the superior colliculus. I bet everybody knows this is the thalamus right here. Okay. Here's some of the caudate. Here's your internal capsule. And we remember the zones. Remember the medial zone right here, intermediate zone, lateral zone. And uh, we're talking in this particular case of the of problems of the intermediate zone and in the lateral zone. I bet everybody also remembers the superior colliculus right here and what happens when we have a bilateral lesion pushing down on here called paranoid syndrome. You can't get your eyes to go up. This is a review of the cerebellum. Um, I think the most important thing to know about the cerebellum is that lesions out here in the intermediate and medial zone give you that classic intention tremor, dysmetria, incoordination. You get into the flocular nodular lobe, you're going to have more postural problems, you're going to have some nystagmus, medial zone, postural, also some nystagmus. We're going to talk later on about the effects of alcohol on, on the anterior lobe here. And we're going to see that the problems are with the trunk and uh, not so much with, with the limbs as would be out here in the lateral zone and intermediate zone. Um, you might want to refresh some of the inputs to the lateral zone. Remember, it's kind of the thinking zone, the planning zone. The intermediate zone is going to be uh, comparing and updating. So you might think about some of those. As far as the, uh, the circuitry of the cerebellum, um, when you start studying for national boards, you might want to think about some of this. We don't emphasize it anymore. You should, however, remember that the Purkinje cells are inhibitory on deep nuclei. All right, so they're using GABA. And all deep nuclei are excitatory. So some of these deep nuclei are going to go to the ruber, some to the thalamus, some of the reticular formation. Okay, so just remember deep. And remember also the classic deep nucleus of the flocular nodular lobe is, is the vestibular complex. That's classic national board. This shows a lesion here in the cerebellum. This is pons right here. I just labeled the facial clickers for those of you who might be interested. Middle cerebellar peduncle. Here's a lesion here on the right side. Uh, this is just some artifact right here, but I hope everybody recognizes that this is pons. This is cerebellum. Um, thought I'd show it to you on a couple other levels. Remember now, the patient had a problem, had a right horners and a contralateral loss of pain and temperature from the body. Just to remind you where the ALS is running. And just show you the same level here. Okay, remember, this is flipped upside down. So here's the pyramid down here. Here's the pyramid. Here's the cerebellum, which we can't see in this one. Here's your inferior cerebellar peduncle, which would be, oh, let's see, probably right about up in there. Hard to see. Just remember, here's your probably a good level four. Here's your cerebellum. Here's the location of ALS. We can go a little rostral. Again, you see the square shape of the pons, middle cerebellar peduncle here. Here's your cerebellum. And just to remind you down here, remember we had a, a right horners in this case and a, and a contralateral or left loss of pain and temperature. Remember things traveling here, ALS. Remember the FAB4. And also maybe a little bit, uh, think about the blood supply to, uh, to the cerebellum. Don't forget you got the pica and the ICA and the superior cerebellar. And I think you should know angiograms. Um, there's no one in the class, first or second, who would know that this is the basal artery. Okay? Now it gets a little harder, okay? You could take this up, you could call this uh, posterior cerebral. And this is a little bit more difficult, superior cerebellar. Um, ICA is really hard down here. I wouldn't expect you to know ICA. Too hard. And pica is really hard down here. So, you know, just try to try to keep in mind, here's posterior cerebral. Remember, we had this little top of the basilar aneurysm right here, top of the basilar artery. So try to learn your, an, your angiograms. Um, this again shows the basilar right here. And here's your posterior cerebral going up like this. This is kind of confusing. Here's your superior cerebellar kind of going out like this. And this shows uh, infarct of the superior cerebellar artery. So this is what it looks like, just like that. 
All right, moving on to clinical vignette number eight. And this is an interesting one. I just had a swig of water. This is something called one and a half syndrome. This is something that uh, you have not had in class. This is something that I think you'll see on the national board. This is pretty tough to understand. It's kind of cool though. So this gets to the MLF and to eye movements and all kinds of things like that, which I know you really love. Now let's, let's go over this carefully. You can see that this patient can't move their eyes to the left. This means you can't move his left eye to the left or his right eye to the left. Okay? You can't do it voluntarily or you can't do it when he moves his, you know, uses the vestibular locker, like move his, you know, move his head to the right, his eyes go to the left. He can't get his eyes to go left. He can't get his left eye to go left. He can't get his right eye to go left. Now, throw in the fact that he can't get his left eye to go right. And you're saying to myself, oh, Harding, you didn't teach me enough of this. Well, this is called one and a half syndrome. Let me show you what it's about. Now, here we go. Here's our old abducens right here. So let me just refresh your memory. Now realize this is the left side, unlike our MRIs, where this would be the right side. But this is just a diagram, so don't worry about it. So here's your abducens nucleus. Now don't forget that nucleus has lower motor neurons that go out to good old LR6 and move your eye, left eye laterally. But don't forget that little inner neuron that crosses and goes up the MLF to cause your right eye to go that way, okay? So if you had a lesion in here, if you had a lesion in here, you couldn't get your either eye to go left. You couldn't look to the left. Now also remember that this left eye won't go right. So there's a little lesion in here, little lesion in here that's getting this ascending MLF fiber. So you're not only getting the nucleus, but you're getting this guy right here coming up and getting the nucleus and that ascending fiber going into the left MLF. If you have a lesion to the left MLF, you can't turn your left eye to the right. So let me show you what this looks like. So here we are, now we're going back to our MRIs and left and right. Here's your abducens nucleus, I hope everybody knows that. Here's your motor seven, here's your superior olive. So we got a little lesion in here, so you can't move your left eye left, your right eye left, but also you can see Here's your abducens the other side, and it's got a fiber coming up here too, okay? So this fiber right here is going to up to the left ocular motor to help you turn your left eye immediately. So we call this one and one half, one and one half, classic national board. All right, moving on, let's do a right acoustic schwannoma. So what's your patient going to complain about? Well, they're going to be dizzy. They're going to probably have some hearing problems. Uh, if you squirt cold or warm water into the right ear, it's not going to work. So you got a right acoustic schwannoma. Now this is in probably in the internal auditory meatus. You're not going to have lesion inside the, the medulla here. And it's on the right side, so you can probably go through most of this and figure it out. If the right side is shot, if the right uh, eighth nerve is shot, that means the right side is down. The eyes are go slowly to the right, snap back to the left. If the right side is shot, you know you're going to stumble to the right, things like that. Um, look here, all muscles on the right side of her face showed evidence of weakness. So it looks like this right acoustic schwannoma also gets a little bit of seven, okay? A little bit of seven, which we'll talk about later. Um, you can see it really got some seven because you have problems with taste, okay? Things like that. Now, you also have some incoordination of the right arm and leg. Well, why would that be? Because this schwannoma, is also affecting the overlying cerebellum. So a right acoustic schwannoma, just think about cranial nerve seven and eight being affected. Uh, review your cranial nerve eight and think about what would happen with the nystagmus and probably have some hearing problems. Um, I think she lost about 75% of her hearing right here. So also think about what the audiogram would look like. And think about what if they put that tuning fork on her head for the Weber or put that tuning fork on her mastoid for the Rin. So you can see there's all kinds of questions that I could ask with this right acoustic schwannoma. Let's review cranial nerve eight, all right? Don't forget, you got a ganglion here for the vestibular fibers, they come into the vestibular nuclei. You got a ganglion here called the spiral ganglion, they're gonna come into the cochlear nuclei. We're gonna affect this in an in a acoustic schwannoma. Now we're also gonna get some cranial nerve seven in that acoustic schwannoma, and we're gonna talk about uh, Bell's palsy later on. But don't forget, you've got the motor fibers coming out, looping up and going around. 
you got some preganglionic parasympathetic fibers coming out of here, remember, superior salivatory lacrimal. Oh, you got some pain from the ear coming in here, remember that. And you're also going to have some taste coming in here. Remember, there's only one ganglion out here, geniculate. And that, those taste fibers are going to go down into solitarius. This is a good drawing because it shows the relationships of the seventh and eighth nerve in the internal auditory meatus and can show what, you know, how close they are together and the schwannoma can just really cause havoc here near the internal auditory meatus. I want you to know that this is the lesion, all right? Not, in, not necessarily in the case we just discussed. This is on the left side. But look what's happening here. Look at this fourth ventricle is all screwed up. Things are kind of pushed all over the place. Here's the right middle cerebellar peduncle here. Look at this big tumor right here. So here's the base of the pons. Here's the fourth ventricle. It looks weird because of the impact of this tumor. And this shows an audiogram. And remember, she lost 75% of her hearing. You can see this is sensory neural. Okay, not, this is a sensory neural loss. And um, let's say, let's say we put that tuning fork on her, on her head doing a Weber test. Uh, she's going to localize it to her good ear. And uh, if, if she does the RIN, uh, air is going to be better than bone, but it's certainly going to be affected. Uh, I wanted to show you this, Schwannoma. Look at this. Look how big that is. Now, for some of you who have been uh, coming to class, <laughs> Here's the, here's, the, here's the medulla down here. Look at it. Here's the pons kind of obliterated. This would be the cerebral peduncle. Okay? Very interesting. But, and here's your cerebellum. But look at the size of that schwannoma. And this shows a schwannoma where there's been a hemorrhage into it. Now, this, this should be looking a little more familiar to you. Um, this could be a little piece of the facial colliculus up here. Here's some pons, here's pons down here. Here's your middle cerebellar peduncle, here's your cerebellum. And I bet everybody knows that there's some deep nuclei up in here too, but look at the size of that hemorrhage into that schwannoma here. Um, this just shows you how it looks. Peripheral on the nerve puts a lot of pressure on it. Um, there is a, the, the, both of these neoplasms, we have schwannoma and neurofibroma, which I'm not gonna say much about are both associated with what we call neurofibromatosis type 2. This gene is on chromosome 22, okay? And um, I just wanted to, this is something that you might see in boards, all right? So it's associated with chromosome 22, uh, neurofibromatosis. Um, if we go down to the chromosome review, we know Parkinson's with 8, Huntington's with 4, and this neurofibromatosis 2, uh, a schwannoma is associated with problems with chromosome 22. Well, here we go. Now to clinical vignette number 10. And um, I look up here and I see double vision. Mm -hmm. And I look down here and I see incontinence. And um, I'm kind of thinking something that we haven't discussed a lot, but I'm kind of thinking multiple sclerosis. This incontinence usually is a key. Double vision is a key. Because multiple sclerosis is a demyelinating disease that, that affects uh, some of the descending pathways involved in control of urine, or control of bladder, and also affects the MLF. I know that. And we, this, this could give you some double vision. Let's go on and look at this. Uh, neurological exam. Now, let's see. On attempted gaze to the right, on attempted gaze, the right eye abducts, but the left eye cannot pass the midline. Well, this sounds like a left MLF problem, okay? Remember from my brainstem lectures that you do also get nystagmus of the right eye. So if you got a left MLF, that right eye's got some nystagmus. Now look at this, this is something called, there's a subtle Marcus Gunn pupil. Well that's getting back to Dr. Heatley and the relative afferent pupil defect. So now we can say, well geez, we got something going on with the MLF and we got some eye movement, we got some problems with incontinence and we got something wrong with our with our pupil, most likely the optic nerve. Then you even go down here and see tone in both lower extremities elevated. Well, that's upper motor neuron. Bilateral Babinski's, that's upper motor neuron. Clonus, upper motor neuron. And multiple sclerosis would just pick away at various pathways throughout the brain. And you kind of get this diversity of problems. 
Um, let's go over this particular case. We had a problem with our left MLF, so you can't turn the left eye to the right. And the right eye has nystagmus. We remember that from brainstem. The relative afferent pupil defects because we're, we've lost probably over 50% of the myelin in uh, the optic nerve. And the test, uh, the case didn't specify left or right eye, so we don't know that. And we have these upper motor neuron problems because we've affected the cortical spinal tracts somewhere along the way. We don't know exactly where, because remember, the cortical spinal tracts are running all the way from cortex all the way down to the spinal cord. Um, here's that MLF, and multiple sclerosis just seeks it out. So if you had a lesion here on the left side, you can't get your left eye to adduct. And the other eye is going to have nystagmus. Just look, look at this nerve, optic nerve. What we're staining here is myelin. You can see the myelin is only staining out here perfectly. All these axons have lost their, their myelin. So something like this would account for the relative afferent pupil defect. Um, classic multiple sclerosis are little plaques like this. This white staining area here would be the plaques. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to identify this. I just want you to see it. And this one is one of the most devastating pictures I've ever seen because all these little gray areas here are multi multiple sclerosis plaques. Look at that. Unbelievable all over the place here, here. This is, this is pretty much normal here. Look at all these plaques. And this shows you some demyelination in the spinal cord. So you can see here's fasciculus grasses. It's getting into the cuneatus and some other pathways. Uh, what I want you to know about multiple sclerosis, I want you to know it's the most common and most important of the human demyelinating diseases. Uh, females are affected a little bit more. It's a disease of young adults. And um, I always have a saying, you know, go, go south, young man, go south, young woman, because if you stay up in the north, you have a greater chance of, of, of getting multiple sclerosis. The other thing you're going to see on national boards is uh, that the immunoglobulin G, the IgG, and their CSF is elevated. And the, the classic thing is the IgG only clonal bands that you'll say, see if you do an electrophoresis. So these oligoclonal bands are seen and is kind of a key for, uh, uh, for patients who have multiple sclerosis. This just says go south, young men and women. It shows that there's a higher risk the further north you are. So Scandinavia has an unusually high number of multiple sclerosis patients. All right, let's turn to the anterior lobe disease of the cerebellum. Now, we talked a little bit about what happens when we have lesions of the intermediate lateral zones of the cerebellum, where we had all oh, dysmetria, dystoidal, cokinesia, uh, movement tremor. Now, when you drink too much alcohol, you damage the anterior lobe of the cerebellum, especially the vermal areas. And you remember that medial zone is, is concerned with uh, taking care of the proximal musculature. So you're going to have problems with uh, the more proximal musculature. Let's go over this a little bit. You can see he's been drinking a lot of alcohol. And uh, let's look for something here. He's got a slight rocking or tremor-like movement of the trunk. This is classic. This is classic anterior lobe. Now you might say, oh, tremor. Gee, that must be a movement tremor. Uh, gee, you just told me this is a vermal anterior lobe. Why isn't that the inter intermediate or lateral? Well, this is classic tremor-like movement of the trunk. is a classic anterior lobe problem of the cerebellum. Now look here. Proximal musculature. His walking gait is broad base. He's got his legs far apart. Oh, legs fart. Oh, sorry. That's, that is a typo. But he's having problems with the proximal musculature, with his balance. Now you can see he's got some hypotonia. That's classic cerebellum but it's of the proximal muscles, okay? So this is an anterior lobe problem in the cerebellum. And this is really a slight rocking tremor-like movement of the trunk. That's very classic anterior lobe. And we can go back to the vermis here. We're talking anterior lobe in the vermis region. You can remember it gets inputs, okay? It's deep nucleus. Does anybody remember it's deep nucleus? It would be vestigial. Inputs would be coming from uh, cuneocerebellar tract, dorsal spinal cerebellar tract, doesn't get any pontine input, so it's kind of dumb, but it's mainly just controlling those trunk muscles. And if you drink too much, this is normal cerebellum back here, 
Look what happens here in the anterior lobe on the midline. Remember, this is the vermis. Look how, look at these big spaces here. So the reason there's spaces in here is that these folia, these little gyri and sulci, are atrophying, which means that these little sulci in here, these spaces get bigger. So you can see there's some atrophy of the, of the anterior lobe, pretty classic alcohol problem. And if you look at some histology, I know you probably looked at these slides in, uh, in histo, but you remember, here's a molecular layer, and here's the Purkinje cell layer right here. Here's a granule cell layer. And this is kind of a normal area of the cerebellum over here. And you go over in here, looks a little molecular layer, looks a little shrunken. You don't really see good perks in here, do you? You can see perks here. And these are some of the effects of the alcohol um, on the anterior lobe of the cerebellum. This shows normal cerebellum here. This shows washed out cerebellum affected by too much drinking. So the classic anterior lobe, and I know you'll see this on national board, and I know you'll see it on my final exam, truncal instability, broad base stance, got those legs far apart, and gait intaxia. Men are affected more than women. And uh, what's interesting is that the ethanol doesn't really kill the cells, but damages their dendrites. And don't forget that we're not sure whether how much the ethanol is killing the cells or, or, or damaging their dendrites versus the person isn't eating right, so it could have a thiamine deficiency. Here's clinical vignette number 12. A 21-year-old college student from New Jersey awakens on a, with a funny feeling of the face. Well, I know right away that this is a Bell's palsy. He dribbles water when he takes a sip, okay? Let's go down here. He tries to close his right eye, but he can't get it all the way closed, okay? Um, he can't raise his right eyebrow at all, okay? He's got a flattening of the right nasolabial fold, so he's got a right Bell's palsy. He's got slight dribbling of the saliva. Now, loud noise really is painful. Well, that's hyperacusis because you know that uh, seventh cranial nerve innervates the sapedius muscle, okay? So this person has a classic Bell's palsy, cranial nerve seven. This is something I'm going to ask you on the exam. This is something that the med twos are going to see on national board. He tastes nothing. Well, cranial nerve seven, all right? Uh, again, Bell's palsy, let's go. Cranial nerve seven, classy. Got to know Bell's palsy. Um, unknown etiology, idiopathic, okay? We don't know why this happens. It could be an inflammation. It could be some compression by some vasculature. You can see there's some risk factors. Diabetes seems to be a risk factor in everything. And remember, with a Bell's palsy, you cannot, no way, wrinkle your forehead. Why? Because it's lower motor neuron out here, okay? You can wrinkle your forehead with a cortical bulbar problem, but you can never wrinkle your forehead with any problems that are in the lower motor neuron with a Bell's palsy. So let's look at this. I say never forget. That's right, because this is on the exam, and some of you missed it. Uh, let's take a peek here. Look at this. This is flat. Look at this. No wrinkles, no nothing. So this person would have a right, could have a right Bell's palsy, right motor seven, something like that. Now look at this person right here. Uh, this person's got a good-looking left. He's got a weak face below the eyes, but he can wrinkle his forehead. So this is a cortical bulbar problem. We call this central. We call this peripheral. It's central because remember, and the cortical bulbars to the lower part of motor seven are only crossed. So this guy's got weakness below the eyes on the right. Where's the lesion got, got to be? It's got to be on the left side above motor seven, because this is the right. It's got to be on the left side, rostral to motor seven, that could take you up in the rostral pons, midbrain, internal capsule cortex. So this is a cortical bulbar problem. This is a lower motor neuron problem, Bell's palsy. Oh, uh, this is a classic lesion here. I wanted to show it to you because you're probably kind of confused by what you're seeing here. I wanted to point out here's, here's a little different section. We've got the pons here. Here's the hippocampus, all right, for in the temporal lobe. Here's the thalamus, ventricles right here, lateral, lateral, third, pons. And out here's a classic Bell's palsy, a lesion, the cranial nerve seven on the left. 
And this is just a review because I think the cranial nerve 7 is uh, probably the most important cranial nerve. And you didn't see this like this in class, but I want you to know it. Remember, here's this, here are the red fibers coming out here. These are the motor fibers. So what would they be coming out of? They'd be coming out of motor 7. Okay, like that. And then remember now, uh, also going out, we've got these fibers right here going out like this. Going to go out to the pterygopalatine ganglion. Okay, so these are coming out of superior, these are coming out of lacrimal. Okay. And we also know that there's some preganglionic parasympathetics like this, this gold going out to the submandibular. So that'd be coming from the superior salivatory nucleus. And what else do we have? Oh yeah, we got some pain, we got some pain and temperature fibers coming in like this, don't we? Remember from the ear? And uh, finally we got taste. Here comes taste. Just coming in like this, like this. And where's that gonna go? Well, that's gonna go into the famous solitary nucleus. So this is cranial nerve seven. Uh, we're talking mainly here about the motor fibers going out and give you a, a big problem with Bell's palsy. But of course, depending upon where the lesion is, you could have problems like in our patient with taste. You could have some problems with salivation, some problems with tearing, all, all the different parts of the facial nerve. Now here's clinical vignette number three. Um, this is classic. The um, daughter brings the mom in because she's become confused and forgetful. And this right away is going to give you a key that the woman has some sort of dementia. And the most common dementia, of course, is going to be Alzheimer's disease. So why don't we just cut to the chase and move on and talk about some things about Alzheimer's. Uh, look at this. Her, her brain had shrunk, okay? And um, let's keep going here. Let's talk about dementia. And let's define it first of all. If we're going to talk about Alzheimer's, we're going to talk about dementia. It's a decline in intellectual or cognitive function to a degree where the person can no longer care for his or her own needs. And is usually accompanied by loss of memory. And I've, I have a relative who has Alzheimer's, and it is this loss of memory. That is the most devastating thing. It's the, this person cannot put uh, things that are happening into his long-term memory. And because he has problems with his hippocampus, he probably has got a lot of plaques in his hippocampus. Um, there are many different types of dementia. The most important one I want you to know is Alzheimer's. There's something called dementia with Lewy bodies. You remember Lewy bodies from, from Parkinson's. Huntington's, as I mentioned earlier, has some, some dementia. Atherosclerosis has a lot. Multiple sclerosis, which we mentioned, has some dementia. Head injury will do it. Prion disease, we'll give it to you. And we all already mentioned Parkinson's disease. Um, I want to show you a CAT scan here. This person has lost so much brain matter. Look at the sizes of the ventricles. Um, again, if you really want to be sure it's Parkinson's, you've got to do histological confirmation. This just shows you some areas of cortex that are affected in different types of dementia. And I won't, won't dwell on this too long. Here's your frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal lobes. And um, this is not that important. Just realize that where the disease attacks will, will tell you something about, will define the dementia. Look at this temporal lobe of a Parkinson's, of an Alzheimer's patient. Look how shrunken it is. Absolutely sh shocking how shrunken this is. If you look at the motor strip, if you look at the motor strip, it's fine. So their, their motor behaviors are pretty good. At least there's no shrinkage of the motor strip. This shows you a, an Alzheimer's brain and a normal brain. Look at the sizes of these spaces in here. These sulci are huge because there's been so much atrophy. This shows you the, what's happening here to the, to the hippocampus. Here's a normal hippocampus. You can hardly see some of this inferior horn in the lateral ventricle. Look at this inferior horn in the lateral ventricle right here because there's been so much shrinkage and cell loss uh, in the hippocampus. Again, this is a Alzheimer's. This is a normal. Again, just wanted to show you it's pretty much the same things here. Uh, 
Here's normal white matter. Look at the absence of white matter here. Okay? So this is normal. This is Alzheimer's. I want you to know just a couple things about the genes and, and things like that. Um, in, in familiar early onset, I want you to know that the, that the, there's the presenilin 1, which is on chromosome 14, has been implicated. And also the presenilin 2 gene, which is on chromosome 1, has been implicated. And the uh, amyloid precursor protein on 21 has been implicated. Now, if you go to the familial late onset, we're talking more about the apolipoprotein E, and it's on chromosome number 19. Uh, a couple pearls. I think the most important thing is, is that uh, there's a loss of cells in nucleus basalis. In addition to all the plaques and uh, uh, tangles, nucleus basalis is affected because this is a source of much of the cholinergic input to the cortex. There's also a real depth of the hippocampus and the temporal cortex. I, I showed you how shrunken up that was. More than 90% of Alzheimer's disease cases are sporadic and of late onset. I want you to know that, too. Uh, let's review some of the chromosomes that we talked about. Parkinson's 8, Huntington 4, the schwannoma, NFT2 is 22, presenilin 1, chromosome 14, presenilin 2, chromosome 1, APP21, APOE19. I wanted to show you these neurofibrillary triangles. These are classic in Alzheimer's disease. And what they consist of are structures turned paired, helical filaments, PHF. And these are abnormal forms of, of a, tau, a tau protein. Okay, so be able to identify these neurofibrillary triangles like that. This shows you a neurotic, a neurotic, neurotic, neurotic a senile plaque. And uh, if we go back, if, well, if you think about those, those tangles, they're within the cell, and these plaques are outside the cells. And they actually have some PHF-containing processes in them out here. And uh, these, these uh, PHF-containing processes surround the, the core containing the beta amyloid. Again, I want you to be able to recognize nucleus basalis here and in Alzheimer's patients, all this cholinergic input coming out of here to the cortex is pretty much lost, and that's why they, they, they give p these people, they try to treat them with, with, um, with drugs that will keep the acetylcholine around a lot longer. Okay, stop. Uh, vignette 14, probably my, my favorite, because as you know, I really uh, have put lateral medullary syndrome on every quiz, I think, that we've had this year and last year. Um, you know I like level three, and uh, this is one of the, the best teaching cases that there is, and this occurs, and it's something that you probably see on national boards. And what we have here is a, a lateral medullary or Wallenberg. We also call this pica for posterior inferior cerebellar artery syndrome. It's on the right side, so you can, you can kind of think what's going to happen if if you've got a right-sided problem. Um, uvula is going to go left. You're going to have some face problems on the right. You're going to have some pain and temperature from the body problems on the, on the, on the left. You're probably going to have a Horner's on the right, too. So while I'm not going through this real carefully, um, we can just keep in mind that we have a lesion right in this particular area. And look at this. This is from a real case. And uh, this is a myelin stain and just basically shows you what's been wiped out here. Of course, the ALS is in here, um, along with those fibers that will give you a Horner's. Uh, we got nucleus ambiguous in here, and then we got some spinal tract and nucleus 5 in here. You can also see there's going to be some pressure on the inferior cerebellar peduncle, which could give you some incoordination on the ipsilateral side. So this is Wallenberg. This is probably a blowout of the posterior inferior cerebellar artery right here. Uh, this is a case that we've seen in class. Again, this is, uh, a, this is real. So let's just outline the medulla here. Here's the pyramids down here. Here's a pyramid. comes like that. So your hypoglossal would be here and here, dorsal motor in here, inferior cerebellar peduncle, okay? And you can see that this white structure here is a lesion, so this would be on the right side. So in this particular patient where the lesion 
um, was on the right. The uvula would go to the left. Uh, pain and temperature from the body would be on the left. Pain and temperature problem from the face would be ipsy on the right. And horns would be on the right. All right, now let's move on to a case of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. This is one of the nastiest diseases. And the first thing that you're going to think about here is that you're going to have an upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron in the same patient. Now, sometimes this can be confusing, but if you're going to have any upper motor neuron problems, you're going to have classic signs like a Babinski, increased reflexes, weakness. And then, of course, if you have lower motor neuron signs, you're going to have atrophy of the muscles. Again, you're going to have weakness, all right? But you're going to, in those muscles that have died, you're going to have hyporeflexia. The real key to this case is that the sensory exam is normal. And then when they say coordination is normal, I think they're talking that, that you know, this hasn't affected the cerebellum. Um, Cognition is perfect. These people are very sharp. But what's happened is, is that this disease is selectively sought out the cortical spinal system, and it's also selectively sought out lower motor neurons in the ventral horn. And this gives you amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Um, I'm showing this because I wanted to show you what some of these ventral roots look like down here. Here's kind of a normal size you can see these ventral roots have shrunken because those lower motor neurons in these segments have died. Um, something that's been uh, in the literature recently has been that, um, that uh, there are 90 different mutations in this, this CUZN superoxide dismutase. We call it SOD1. And this has been implicated in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So just think about this uh, CUZN superoxide dismutase. We call it SOD1. I was reading an article about it the other week, but just if you just relate this to ALS, oligoclonal bands to MS, that's good enough for, for my course. Um, this is just to show you that, remember I said that the cortical spinal system is affected in ALS, and you can see that even the cells of origin of those cortical spinal cells have, have died, and the motor strip is shrinking, which I find is very interesting. Here's the sensory strip here. So way at the beginning up there, at the cell of origin, up there in the BET cells of those cortical spinal fibers, they're dying. And in fact, you can, it's reflected in the size of the precentral gyrus here, the motor strip. This shows uh, some classic cases. Let's look in here. You can see we're standing for myelin. So here would be your fasciculus gracilis, cuneatus. And look at this. This lack, absence of myelin out here near the LCST. Here's a, here's a very damaged, it's not a lack of myelin, it's just that the myelin antiaxons are gone. So you're not going to stain for the myelin. So here's the position of the lateral cortical spinal tract. And you can't really tell much in the ventral horn because of uh, the absence of those cells because they're staining myelin. But here's the LCST here. Hydrocephalus is something that... Uh, we didn't talk much about. Uh, we talked a little bit about the cisterns. We talked a little bit about the uh, CSF and the ventricles. I'm putting this in here because I think it's an interesting case. Basically, what you're doing is you're increasing the amount of cerebral spinal fluid, and therefore you're kind of stretching certain parts of the brain because when those ventricles fill up, they're going to cause stretching of the brain. And depending upon where the brain is being stretched, uh, that's going to give you your symptoms. Now, if we look at some of these, uh, a bifrontal headache could just be because of stretching of the, of the meninges. An intermi intermittent diplopia, that could be because you're stretching some, some cranial nerves, like cranial nerve six or three or four. Unsteadiness of gait would be you're causing stretching of, of, of fibers of the cerebellum, either going in or going out, something like that. Um, you can see here this patient had double vision on lateral gaze to the right or left. And um, this is most likely probably due to, to stretching of the, of the uh, sixth nerve on the left and the right. Um, here you've got coordination was decreased. This is probably the effect of the hydrocephalus stretching inputs to the, to the cerebellum, or, or who knows? A bilateral intention tremor certainly is a cerebellar problem. 
So let's take a little look at hydrocephalus here. Um, and this is just some of the things I already said. I said there's an increase in CFS. There's considerable distortion or stretching in the brain. This accounts for the headaches, meningeal stretching, the bilateral stretching, cranial nerve 6, and the cerebellar signs. Now, lots of times in hydrocephalus, uh, people have urinary incontinence, and also because you're stretching the frontal lobe, there'll be some dementia included. Now, we haven't spent a lot of time on the ventricular system, but I wanted to review it because I think it's important. We did talk about uh, these spaces in the brain here, you have lateral ventricles, third ventricles, aqueduct into the fourth, and then the CSF can leave and, and go into the subarachnoid space where it's reabsorbed, okay? So here's your subarachnoid space, and here are your ventricles. And there are a couple little foramen, Lushka and Magendi back here in the fourth ventricle that, that let the CSF out. Now, there's two terms I want you to know. I want you to know communicating hydrocephalus and non-communicating hydrocephalus. If it's a communicating hydrocephalus, okay, that means that this CSF inside here is communicating with the subarachnoid space. So if you have a communicating hydrocephalus, you're having problems with a reabsorption of the CSF because of something out here in the subarachnoid space. That is, things are communicating. It is getting out of the ventricles into the subarachnoid space, so we call it a communicating hydrocephalus. On the other hand, if there's a problem in the ventricular system, like in the cerebral aqueduct, third ventricle, and the CSF is blocked internally in these ventricles, we call it non-communicating because it's really not communicating out here with a subarachnoid space. This shows a, what I think is a neat picture of the, kind of it looks like cauliflower, the choroid plexus right here. For those of you uh, interested, here's the pons and the superior click is right here, a little bit, a little different look. And um, classic national board's going to be uh, talking about CSF and um, normal volume in there is about 140 milliliters and it makes about 500 milliliters a day, this classic national boards. Um, you can have problems with hydrocephalus. In this particular case, you can see gliosis of the cerebral aqueduct right here. We're almost closed down. Now you should think, oh gee, is this a communicating or a non-communicating hydrocephalus? Well, it's a non-communicating because the problem is in the ventricular system. Look at the size of these ventricles. Wow, hydrocephalus. You know, the other thing this could be is could be called hydrocephalus ex vacuo, which is that in Parkinson patients, the cortex shrinks and the, this just gets bigger. So we call that hydrocephalus ex vacuo. But look at the size of those ventricles. And uh, actually, this shows hydrocephalus ex vacuo. A lot of shrinkage here of the cortex in a Parkinson patient. And then you shrink all this cortex, the ventricles get bigger. And it's called hydrocephalus ex vacuo. This I like because it shows a tumor right here in the foramen of Monroe. So the ventricles here, lateral ventricles, would be leading into the third ventricle. Look at the size of that tumor. So again, um, things aren't going to be communicating. So this would be a non-communicating hydrocephalus. This is another one. Look at the size of the fourth ventricle. Whopping big hydrocephalus. Here's your middle cerebellar peduncle. Here's your classic oh, pons, I don't know, probably level four or five. I could push a point and say, oh, right there is abducens, things like that. Look at the size of that. Oh, oh, here's a dentate. Look what's happened to the dentate. It's been pushed over like that. Middle cerebellar peduncle, cerebellum. Don't you just love the pons? Um, when you talk about CSF, you've got to talk about the choroid plexus, which we haven't mentioned much. But these little tufts here, you can see, here's a, a blood vessel. And then we have these, these cells, these cuboidal cells here. And the blood, these blood vessels have little fenestrations right here. So the blood act can easily get out of the, of the blood vessels. But then what happens is, is that there's some tight junctions between these cuboidal epithelial cells, and it really controls what gets from the bloodstream out into the CSF. So while these are fenestrated and the blood can get out of there pretty easily, there are tight junctions between these cells and some cilia here that control uh, what is the uh, production of the CSF. And if we're talking about the choroid plexus, 
fenestrated capillaries. We should talk a little bit about the blood-brain barrier. I like this, you know, here you are in a vessel in the brain, you're trying to get out. Hey, let me out, it says. And we should compare over here, this is what happens inside the brain. This is a, a, a normal capillary. And what I want you to notice are these, these, these spaces here, okay? Here's an endothelial cell. There's some spaces here, there are pinocytotic vesicles. So normal capillaries, it's not that hard to get out of there, okay? But in the brain, things are very much tighter, okay? Here's your endothelial cell. You don't see any pinocytotic vesicles, and look at these tight junctions. The other thing is, the other thing is, is that these glial feet processes, or a foot process, the astrocytes, are coming down in here, and there's also a, a basement membrane down here. So the, the brain is very selective about what gets out of this vessel into the brain, and we call this the blood-brain barrier. Um, clinical vignette 17 is a peripheral neuropathy. I think what you want to think about when you do this, when you're studying late at night, you want to think about uh, glove and stocking. You want to think about things that are happening out in the hands or in the feet, burning sensations, uh, funny feelings, okay? Um, loss of feeling, so, so a peripheral neuropathy could affect either motor or sensory, but it's usually in a glove and stocking distribution. And depending upon the type of fibers that it gets. It could get pain fibers. It could get motor fibers. If it gets, uh, depending upon the type of fibers, that's going to define what the peripheral neuropathy symptoms are going to be. And if we just kind of look at this, this, this patient's got progressive lower extremity weakness. So if he's got some weakness in his lower extremity, and here he's got some diabetes, lower extremity weakness is going to be affecting the motor fibers. He's also got some loss of feeling in his feet. So he's going to get some of the sensory fibers. If he's got tingling and numbing, numbing, numbness, he's going to be affecting the sensory fibers. Again, it starts distally. It starts out in the, usually starts in the feet, moves up the leg, and eventually get to the hands and then into the arms. So this is a peripheral neuropathy. Now it says here deep tendon reflexes were absent. Well, this could be accounted for either by this lack of uh, damage to the sensory input or the motor output. So you have to think about nerve damage here, nerve damage in a peripheral neuropathy. This is a glove stocking. When you think in peripheral neuropathy, classic national board. Depending upon the axon's damage, you know, you could have a sensory loss, you could have a motor loss, or you could have both. Now, if you've got those big fibers, if you've got those big alpha-beta fibers coming in here, you're going to have a Romberg, because remember, those big alpha-beta fibers are going into the dorsal column system, and a test of the dorsal column system is a rumber. So just keep that in mind if you get those big alpha betas. Glove and stocking. You're going to see this on national boards, peripheral neuropathy. Clinical pearls. I think a common one is diabetic, peripheral, or distal polyneuropathy. Um, as it says here, it can be sensory motor. It can affect autonomic functions. Don't forget that. Um, lack of sweating. Okay, you can have problems with your bladder. And uh, again, if, 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 if the di diabetes affects the, um, the uh, optic nerve, then you could have problems with your pupils. It wouldn't necessarily be a polyneuropathy. Um, anyway, you can read this. This is pretty straightforward. Just uh, keep in mind the glove and stocking. Now, when we look at our chart, again, it's going to depend upon whether or not we get the axons, whether we get uh, motor fibers, sensory fibers, and you should think about which categories could be affected in a, in a polyneuropathy. Now, muscular dystrophy is a good one because we have to think about a myopathy. And um, the classic here is a, a, a young child, usually a boy comes in, he's having difficulty with those proximal muscles, having difficulty walking, climbing, appears clumsy. His calves are enlarged, remember that. Contractors, contractures of his Achilles tendons, we know that. Muscle tone is decreased because the muscle is dying. It's a proximal problem, and he's got a positive Gower sign. That is, it's very difficult for him to get up. You'll see that. Sensation was normal. Well, this is a myopathy. Tendon reflexes are decreased. Well, it's a myopathy. Plantar reflexes are flexor. Well, that's normal. It's a myopathy. His gait is waddling. This is defining characteristic of muscular dystrophy. 
This just shows you some histology, which we didn't do in class. Some of the fibers are actually hypertrophy. A lot of them degenerate. A lot of them are just already at atrophying. And you get an increase in this endomycial fibrosis here. But this would be from a, from a patient with muscular dystrophy. And again, if it's a muscle disease, what are you going to think about? You're going to think about, well, are you going to get any fasciculations? No. You're going to get any fibrillations? Yeah. Uh, is that CK going to go up? Yes, it is. And this shows Gower sign. This shows the large calves. This is classic March enlargement, marked enlargement of the calves, hyperlordosis because your muscles are weak, Deca decreased tendon reflexes because the muscle's dying. Normal sensation. It's a myopathy. It's a myopathy. Normal sensation. Here's an interesting one. A 14-year-old high school basketball star is six feet four inches in height and then grows three more inches over the summer. So you're thinking, oh my gosh, something's wrong with growth hormone here. But he becomes sluggish and fatigues easily, and he's also got a visual deficit. He has something called a bitemporal, hmm, superior quadrinopsia. Hmm, well, I know, what are you thinking here? Well, I don't know. You never heard about this from Dr. Heatley or Dr. Ulrich. Um, but let's take a look at what could be happening here. Um, we know this one, we know this back here, okay? We know that lesions in these different banks of the calcarine uh, can give you a right upper quadrant hemianopsia or a right lower quadrant hemianopsia. But where else could you get something like this? Well, you could get something like this right here um, at the optic chiasm. But it's going to be a bitemporal. It's going to be bitemporal. And it's either going to, it, and if we get just a part of it, if we just get a part of it, it could be an upper or a lower quadrinopsia. Let's take a look at it. So let's just think about a pituitary lesion here, because remember, he's got some problems with growth, growth hormone. If it just comes up and gets the most ventral fibers of the, um, of the optic chiasm, okay? That would probably give you problems with your upper or superior quadrant. So it would be a, a bitemporal superior quadrinopsia. This just shows right here some stretching of the chiasm. The tumor, this is the tumor lying right underneath it. Okay. So anyway, that takes care of that one. Let's do clinical vignette number 20. And this is a real easy one because it's an epidural hematoma. 29-year-old motorcyclist skids. He's got a brief lucid period, okay, brief period of consciousness. He's got uh, damage to his right lateral aspect of his skull, so you're thinking middle meningeal artery. He's got a dilated right pupil, so you're thinking uncle herniation on the right, okay? Um, let's take a look at this, respiratory arrest. Why would that happen? Well, you've got an uncle herniation pressing down on those brainstem centers of the medulla, okay? Epidural hematoma. Well, what's it look like? Well, here's the break right here, and here's the epidural hematoma. You can see it's shaped like a lens, shaped like a lens. So you should be able to differentiate this epidural from a subdural, and I'll show you that in a minute, okay? And it's here what we've done is we've had a rupture of the middle meningeal artery. This just shows an epidural hematoma. Look at the size of that. Unbelievable, unbelievable. This shows it again. Here's the dura. Look at the size of that. Think about the pressure that's putting on the brainstem, on the uncus. Think about the herniation. Think about the pupil. Okay? And this just shows what can happen after one of these epidurals. Look at that. It's actually indented the brain right here. Now, this shows a subdural. Because here's the dura, and look at all that blood, that unbelievable mess underneath there. Here's the occipital bone. This would be the front of the brain, the scalp. So this is a subdural hematoma. And uh, what we've probably done here is there's been some damage to some of those bridging veins. Okay, so it's subdural. And I just want you to be able to differentiate between epidural and subdural, especially when it comes to how it looks on a CAT scan. And here's your subdural. It looks kind of like a quarter moon. If you remember, your epidural was kind of lens-shaped, okay? Now, remember, you can tear these, these bridging veins. Older people, quite easily, uh, tear their, these bridging veins and get these subdural hematomas. 
Clinical vignette 21. Oh, he's got a short-term memory loss, progressive difficulty with walking. Well, I'll tell you what this is. It's a subacute combined degeneration. So what we've got here is subacute combined degeneration is, is something that we had in class early where we had a demyelination of the dorsal column system, and we also had a demyelination of the lateral cortical spinal tract in the same patient. Okay? Now, there are a few other things that also happen in this, but I want you to think about what would happen if you lost, if it had some demyelination of the dorsal column system, you're going to have some funny feelings. Uh, you're probably going to have some loss of two point, et cetera. And then think about what happens if, in the same patient if you have the lateral cortical spinal tract affected, you're going to have some upper motor neuron problems. And in fact, this shows some demyelination in the dorsal columns, right? Here's the fasciculus grasses, here's cuneatus. And look out here, some demyelination out here in the lateral cortical spinal tract. Now, this is a thiamine B12 problem, okay, and it, it affects the, the, the myelin. Subacute combined degeneration, dorsal column problems, lateral cortical spinal problems in the same person. Now, there are also some other problems in, in this patient. If you recall, they had some memory problems. <clears throat> and um, as it says here, yup, you've been wondering about the memory and the cupping of the, of, the, of the nerve as it comes out the disc. And this just shows the LCST and the lack of myelination of the LCST, lack of myelination in the dorsal columns. Um, well, the B12 deficiency affects the myelin of the optic nerves. That makes sense. And the hippocampus, which would give you some of your memory problems. S1 radiculopathy, what can we say? I mean, this is a classic, absolute classic. You're going to have problems with a disc where? L5, S1. Gets S1. Um, what's going to happen here is he cannot stand on the toes of his left foot. Uh, can elevate his leg. What else? Shooting pain. These are all classic, classic S1 radiculopathy. Um, you're going to see this on national boards. You're going to see this on my final exam. This just shows how things are organized. Okay, You can see right here. Here's that L5 S1 disc getting, and it's going to come in here and get that S1 root. This is a, a good one I found on the, on the internet. Here's the vertebra for L5. Here's S1. Here's the L5 S1 getting coming in here and pinching that that S1 right here. Here's an infarct centered in Broca speech area. Well. You know that this patient's got some problem in the left hemisphere, in the inferior frontal gyrus, just in front of motor cortex. And um, we don't have to go into it too much, but we know that they're going to have a Broca's problem. They're also going to have some hemiplegia. And remember, Broca's is on the left side. So they're going to have their Broca's speech problem. They're going to have a right, probably a right hemiparesis, because that motor strip is right behind it. So let's think a, bit, a little bit about a Broca's speech problem. Also, it's probably going to involve the middle cerebral artery. Don't forget that. Look at the cyst here from an in, that develops after an infarct. All right, this is covering a lot of pretty much wiping out the uh, Broca's area on the uh, inferior frontal gyrus. Okay, middle cerebral artery would have been the culprit here. And when we think about Wernicke's and we think about that connection between the arcuate fasciculus, here's Broca's right here. We have a lesions in Broca on the left side, and here's a little lesion. Look at that. All right. The this, this, this speech is non-fluent. That's very labored. Labored, telegraphic, baby talk. A uh, person is very aware of it, very, very frustrated. Okay. Remember, Wernicke's, they talk like crazy, but they use all kinds of funny words, and they're not embarrassed. Okay. Here, they're very embarrassed, very telegraphic, forced speech. Uh, but the reception is good. I mean, they're getting the sensory signals. They can hear okay, but they're very, very upset about what's going on. So know the difference between a Broca's and a, and a Wernicke's. In this particular case, we're talking about a, a Broca's. And you remember this from the, the movies that uh, Dr. Watson showed. Um, here's the examiner saying to a Broca's patient, you know, what's a boy doing? He says, cookie is mm, catch, you know. Now, if this was a Wernicke's, this BL, the patient BL, would be talking a mile a minute about those cookies. But this is very forced, very telegraphic. Left side, Broca's speech area. Um, when you're talking Broca's, you're also talking a little problem back in here 
you're going to move back into the motor strip. If you move back into the motor strip on the left side, you can have a left hemiparesis, and this is just to reemphasize the most important pathway in the brain, which is the cortical spinal lateral cortical spinal pathway. Remember, if you had a Broca's problem up there on the left, you're going to have a right hemiparesis. There's that nasty lesion right there. All right, clinical vignette 24 is the second to the last one. All of a sudden, this mildly hypertensive man is watching his favorite TV show when he suddenly became weak in his right arm and leg. He was taken immediately to the hospital and given a complete neuro exam. The only finding was a pure hemiparesis that included, in addition to his hemiparesis, increased reflux. Um, well, this is pure. This is, uh, this is about the only thing happening. And there are a couple different places you can get this. It's very hard to get this in cortex. One of the easiest places for this to happen is in the internal capsule. And we call this a little lacuna lucun stroke of the internal capsule. But pure motor hemiparesis would be in the posterior limb of the internal capsule. Let's see, he's got weakness in his right arm and leg, so it'd be in the left posterior limb of the internal capsule. You should uh, be able to identify the internal capsule. Here's the anterior limb right here. Here's the posterior limb right there, okay? So here's the lesion right there. Here's your thalamus. Here's your caudate. Here's your putamen and globus pallidus. Here's your third ventricle. Here's the retrolenticular limb of the internal capsule. And here's your lesion right there on the left side, posterior limb, pure motor hemiparesis. Blood supply, of course, you should know, to this posterior limb. Gets a dual blood supply, double jeopardy. Anterior choroidal gets the ventral part, lateral striates get the dorsal part. The final case is a pure sensory stroke. Now, these are also hard to get in cortex. They're also hard to get in the internal capsule because the sensory pathways coming up from the thalamus are so diffusely distributed. So the place where you get a pure sensory stroke is going to be in the thalamus. And um, you know a little bit about the thalamus. You know VPM, you know VPL right here. So pure sensory stroke here of the VPL right here is going to give you contralateral problems and sensation from the arm and leg. And this will give you contralateral problems from the face. Remember, the blood supply comes off the posterior uh, cerebral thalamogeniculate arteries. So that would give you a little, le a little lesion here would give you a pure sensory stroke. I want to thank everybody for listening to this. I know it's fast. Uh, it's been a long day, but I hope this helps in reviewing for boards and the, uh, the final exam. Thanks a lot.